Welcome to America's Commercial Real Estate Show, your source for market intel, forecasts, and strategies. Hello, I'm Michael Bull. Thank you for being with us. This segment is brought to you by Buxton. Checking them out for predictive and mobile analytics. You won't believe what you can do with this information. If you're in commercial real estate, at least check it out. The website is buxtonco.com. Well, today we're talking about retail real estate and specifically grocery anchored centers. Of course, we're all kind of familiar with, with all the changes that have gone on with retail. Some of us think, hey, isn't retail struggling? <laughs> some of it has and some of it might be. But you might be surprised what's been going on in the grocery anchored world. Please welcome my guest. It's Jesse Shannon, Jesse's Chief Investment Officer with Branch Properties. Jesse, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Excited yeah. to be here. Appreciate you being with us. And uh, the first thing I'd like to uh, ask you about is, Really, what are you seeing for sales trends for your grocery anchor tenants? I mean, you know, what what happened with their sales kind of during the the pandemic, and 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 now and now, what do you see? Are they are they doing well? Surprisingly, Michael, the, the grocers are doing extremely well mm -hmm. right now. Uh, we expected during the pandemic to see a fall off in in sales for both our you know our lead grocers that operate in the southeastern United States, which are our Publix and Kroger. And we really expected to see a shift to uh, an online uh, Amazon-based um, um, grocery delivery model. And that's really not what played out to everyone's surprise, even for, for those of us in the industry. What we really saw was that Publix and Kroger saw same-store sales growth of, of 14 and, and, or 16 and 14 percent, respectively. And we saw a huge uptick in, in customer traffic in the stores, it, even in the height of the, of the pandemic. Uh, shockingly, that trend has continued, and both of those chains have seen same-store same sales growth on top of those kind of staggering, you know, double-digit uh, uh, numbers of, of uh, 16 and 14 percent. And it seems like right now, uh, this is, is the heyday, if you will, for, for some of these larger grocers. Yeah. Well, that's interesting to see. And, and is some of that because there's less options to eat out? Or why do you think their sales have been doing so well? Well, during the pandemic, that was, that was absolutely the case, mm -hmm. is that there was a, a change in consumption patterns from eating out in restaurants to eating at home. And, and ironically, in 2019 was the first time in history that restaurant sales exceeded grocery sales. Uh, but during the pandemic, that, that obviously dramatically uh, flip-flopped. And certainly, while people were staying at home and quarantining, they were shopping at their traditional grocery store. And typically, the traditional grocery store, the grocery store that offered all their goods and services. We did see a shift during that period of time from niche grocers or, or organic-only grocers like Whole Foods or potentially Sprouts to the traditional grocery store, i.e. Publix and Kroger, where they could buy their full grocery basket. If you were going to make a, a trip to the grocery store, it wasn't going to be three or four trips, which was the previous consumption pattern. You were only going to make one. So definitely during the pandemic, what surprised us coming out of the pandemic is we expected to see a drop off in that same store sales comp. That really hasn't happened. Yeah. Both of them have comped up on top of those dramatic lift during the, during the uh, pandemic, even though people have started to venture out um, and eat, eat in restaurants again. But, yeah. but that hasn't happened. Interesting. Well, you know, you got to go to Whole Foods to get those weird fancy soaps. <laughs> so, <laughs> like that. How are you going to do without that? Um, what about your shop tenants, the, the smaller tenants around your grace ranker? How did they do through the pandemic and then today? The success of the shop tenants definitely varied. Uh, and it depended on whether or not they were considered, you know, a necessity-based retailer, i.e. someone selling food, uh, and or medical supplies. So, you know, a lot of our a lot of our tenants today in these grocery anchored open air neighborhood shopping centers are, are very different than they were 20 years ago. A lot of our tenant composition today is medical uses. Mm -hmm. Those thrive during the pandemic. Urgent care facilities, testing facilities, things of that nature. Drug stores, of course, did well. Uh, and then, you know, banking institution and cer certain service institutions, soft goods retailers nail salons, a lot of the service-based kind of non-essential daily needs retailers, the ones that really struggled during the pandemic and, and required some assistance during that period of time. Yeah. One of the things that, and I made the 
some hardship on retail property owners around the country during uh, the Great Recession. And I'm not sure why we call it great. I didn't think it was that great. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, these uh, clauses where the tenants have some rights, these shop tenants have some rights, right, to maybe reduce the rent or even cancel their lease if the anchor goes dark. Um, what are you seeing today in, in new leases uh, as far as the trend there with these co-tenancy clauses? It, it depends on the the size of the tenant and the nature of their business. So typically in a grocery anchored shopping center, the tenants may want to tie their their um, occupancy to the grocer. We typically have leveraging power in those deals and, and don't allow that because uh, they really, most tenants today want to uh, open in a in, 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 uh, grocery anchored shopping center because they have found that their sales are stronger when they co-locate with a successful grocer than when they're in an inline traditional strip center. So we have some leverage. That being said, some of the larger, what we would call soft goods, junior anchor tenants like a Ross or a TJ Maxx or um, a Home Goods, these type of tenants typically require co-tenancy clauses. And the danger with these, these co-tenancy clauses from our standpoint or the risk, I would say, is that if a tenant fails and you have multiple leases tied to those tenants, it, it's somewhat like a house of cards where one card falls and you can bring down the whole house. Uh, so we, we have tried to steer away from dependency upon co-tenancy clauses. We certainly try to mitigate them because they do introduce a lot of risk to the investment. Yeah, and I assume lenders and investors are wary of them as well. They are, uh, you know, right. You yeah. wouldn't, you wouldn't know that right now with the way some of these deals are being priced. Yeah. You know, the market's kind of pricing through it right now in this current environment. But certainly, there is a a significant uh, delta in capitalization rates between your traditional grocery anchor deal with little or almost no co tenancy, mm -hmm. and what we would look at is in in a power center where we have heavy co tenancy. The trade-off between those two uh, uh, deals may be as much as 150 to 200 basis points wow. on a cap rate basis wow. to compensate the investor for that level of risk. Yeah, well, it makes sense because that's a huge risk if that uh, first card starts to fall. That's, that's exactly right. And you've mentioned a lot of tenants. Uh, what are some of the tenants and in, in, in sectors that of tenants that are really expanding now? Certainly, our grocers are. Uh, you know, Publix has ramped up their their uh, new store program significantly. Um, we, we have more Publixes right now under development uh, than we've ever had in the history of our company, and we've been in business, you know, forty five plus years. So uh, that that's definitely the medical medical tenants, specifically kind of uh, boutique medical or uh, concierge medical. That's a real push right now. Uh, where you you know you pay a f an annual fee, you reduce the number of patients in the in the doctor's office, and therefore you get um, kind of high touch, uh, 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 better medical care at a premium. That's definitely a use that we've seen expanding in our shopping centers. Um, yeah, it, it, still fast casual, quick service restaurants have really expanded. Those that rely more on a takeout model than they do a dine in model, and we've seen a reduction in in uh, we've seen an increase in the frequency of these restaurants seeking space from us, but a reduction in square footage. So, so coming out of the pandemic, one of the major themes and one of the major kind of expansion areas are quick service restaurants where you order at the counter or you put in an online order and you eat it to go with limited uh, uh, in, in, in restaurant dining. Yeah. And you mentioned cap rates, uh, Jesse. So kind of what are you seeing for trends there on cap rates on these grocery anchored centers? There's a lot of buyer demand, right? There is. And, and I, I will say this, it, it wasn't nearly as significant as it was. Uh, it's more significant now than it was 12 months ago. Uh, we've seen a, a compression of cap rates to the tune of about 100 basis points in the last 12 months. Wow. Most institutional investors were very leery of retail a year ago. Uh, they felt like uh, uh, online um, and omni-channel sales were really going to impact physical retail. And a lot of investment was moving towards multifamily and industrial during that period of time. Coming out of the pandemic with grocery stores doing extremely well, where one would have thought in that particular situation, if there was ever a time for online grocery delivery to succeed, that would have been it, but that yeah. didn't play out. And so what's happened is institutions are underweighted to retail. They're all trying to diversify their portfolios. If you're going to invest in retail, where's the safest place to be? Grocery anchored retail. And so that's resulted in, in um, 
historical pricing in our sector. And it's all really happened, Michael, in the last nine to 12 months. Yeah. Tops. yeah, it's crazy. There seems to be a lot of buyer demand on almost almost every sector. But uh, I love the space you guys are in, the grocery anchor centers, you know, that necessity. We got to get groceries, right? Everybody's got to eat, right? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's Everybody's right. Everybody's got to eat. So while we're in the discussion of cap rates, what's your thoughts on cap rates moving forward in this space? You know, we're, the Fed's saying that they're going to raise interest rates. Uh, correct. So that's 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 the uh, the million dollar question, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Um, it, we're uh, tired of predicting. I, I personally am tired of trying to predict which way rates are going to go, even with what the Fed signals. But my feeling is, yes, rates will rise. I'm not sure, though, there isn't so much capital right now uh, in, in the private equity space, especially seeking inflation protection, so hard assets, mm -hmm. that uh, equity right now won't accept lower yields. So I don't see a dramatic movement in cap rates in the near yeah. term, next 12 to 24 months. What I see is, is expectations being reset on what an acceptable yield is in this market. So... Yes, typically cap rates have moved with interest rates, but without a significant rise in interest rates, given the amount of pent-up demand, especially for inflation protection, i.e. hard assets or real estate, I see real estate accepting lower yields. And that's really playing out right now in the market. We haven't seen any cooling in pricing, even though the 10-year Treasury has made a, a pretty significant run here in the last 60 days. Jesse, can you share with our audience a, a sample cap rate on a, on a closing that's recently happened in what the actual rate was. And um, yeah, we, we recently have, have sold six assets, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the pricing on that, um, all grocery anchor deals, was, was around a five mm -hmm. uh, weighted. Um, uh, and and uh, I think the expectation was, as 12 months ago, that may have been 75 to, to 100 basis points yeah. wide of that. And that was a pretty long term on the anchor Yes, most of our most of our anchor terms were you know ten plus years. But to be honest with you, that's really not affecting pricing. Shockingly, mm -hmm. the anchor term of the grocers, because we have sales performance at these individual locations. Mm -hmm. So what makes up for lack of term a lot of times for us and being able to sell these assets is well, this store is a high performing store, and even though they have five years, it's highly profitable, high performing, and the sales trend is positive. Typically, those grocers don't don't leave those locations. Yeah, and you guys are uh, buy existing product, right? You also do a lot of development. So, when you're doing development deals these days, are or is it really uh, starting from uh, scratch, or are you doing some redevelopment of some of these older centers and older retail? You know, we we I, originally, I would say seven eight years ago, we were doing a lot more redevelopment and repositioning of existing assets. Those are those deals are fewer and further between because of demand for existing deals has, has increased so substantially. Today, it's true ground up raw land uh, development, uh, almost exclusively in our portfolio, and less redevelopment. Yeah, and that's just because of the scarcity of those those types of opportunities. And geographically, is it more suburban or infill, or or what are you seeing? Predominantly suburban. Yeah. We do have one infield deal right now. Mm -hmm. We're doing in the in, in the city of Atlanta, but mm -hmm. most of our projects, you know, we're all we're Georgia, Florida, North and South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, and Virginia, almost exclusively suburban. And and mm -hmm. we're we're really capturing a trend right now, which is as fewer people working in offices, living closer to home, or working from home. And there's definitely been kind of a reverse migration here over the last 18 months from urban areas to suburban areas. Yeah. And we're, we're, our, our grocers are definitely and our shopping centers are benefiting from that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of suburban markets uh, are really doing well, especially the, the closer rim ones is what I kind of want to see. What about construction costs as, in, as far as operations and, and, uh, and then development wise, how is construction costs impacting you guys? Uh, we, we are definitely uh, uh, seeing a dramatic rise in construction costs. It's mm -hmm. certainly making deals more challenging uh, to, to finance and to, for which to secure capital. Uh, we have managed to do that because shop rents have been moving in concert with, with uh, the, those uh, increases in prices. But unquestionably today, uh, there's there's scarcity of labor. There's scarcity of goods. There are fewer contractors willing to bid jobs. A lot of got, a lot of contractors wanting to go into negotiated bids. We can't really do that with our development program. So um, there's shortages of certain materials, and that seems to be kind of a rolling issue. It was white TPO roofing, which we use in all of our shopping centers. It's now switchboards, 
certain hill houses. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you never know where the delay is coming from. That's yeah. certainly making uh, development challenging. We're having to increase our, our time frames for construction. And, and costs are rising dramatically. We've been able to overcome that because rents are, are moving in concert with that, but it, it's a challenging environment right now to get deals off the yeah. ground. And I guess your anchor tenants are understanding of potential delays. Uh, they, they, they are, uh, yeah. to, to, you know, uh, you didn't want to be the first one coming out of the pandemic with those delays, but yeah. it's almost becoming uh, an expectation now right. from some of our tenants that projects are going to take longer and be more delayed. Uh, they're they're working with us on that. What they want is certainty of opening dates, yeah. but unquestionably, a lot of projects are getting delayed, and they're getting delayed a lot of times on tenant specific items that are uh, unique to their store's prototype right. that we have no control over the purchasing on. So, right. so they're sensitive because they're dealing with themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Jesse, what would you uh, forecast moving forward for and kind of shop rents uh, development? Uh, a volume and, and just the grocery anchor center market moving forward? I, I think in the near term, I think shop rents will continue to increase. I mean, we're definitely in an inflationary environment. I think uh, grocery, grocery stores will continue to expand because they've seen really positive same store sales growth and typical, typically groceries benefit from inflation. Uh, believe it or not, you would think their margins get compressed during inflation. That's typically not the case. Their margins widen. Uh, and, and they're the beneficiary of kind of rising commodity prices, which historically have been very flat. So I see the grocers trying to put more stores on the ground, especially the traditional grocers, mm -hmm. uh, less so from kind of the niche or boutique grocers or limited service, you know, kind of what I saw, limited service grocers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the future is bright from a development standpoint. I think the only impediment for us, and you just alluded to it, is, is can we make the cost make sense yeah. uh, given, given where, where they're going to get these development deals off the ground? But, but uh, I, I think the future is extremely bright. I think uh, the grocers will be aggressive, and I think uh, shop rents will, will continue to rise, at least in the near term, you know, next 12 to 24 months. Yeah, well, that's good. It's great for the industry, great for uh – for everybody. I'm doing, I'm doing the Snoopy dance now. Yeah, so. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Jesse, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank Great you very much. Appreciate, appreciate you having me. All right. And thank you for joining us around the country. Please let us know what you think. Hey, we appreciate you sharing the show and uh, reaching out to us. And until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn, and laugh and join us for America's Commercial Real Estate Show. show is brought to you by Buxton. Take leasing site selection and due diligence to the next level. Make the right decisions with on-demand mobile data. Visit buxtonco.com. By Bull Realty. For proven commercial real estate asset and occupancy solutions, contact me. My email is michael at bullrealty.com. By Commercial Agent Success. Expert level commercial real estate broker training. Cloud Access 1 up to 21 one-hour videos visit commercialagentsuccess.com. Thank you for reviewing, subscribing, and sharing America's commercial real estate show.